Okay, yeah, um, I will now give you an overview of the idea, the setup and the outcome of our virtual access project on um, near real time observations of snow water equivalent on Svalbard. Um, our project consisted of two parts. Um, with the first part, we aimed at assessing the accuracy, um, spatial representativeness and applicability of a new automated monitoring technique for measuring the snow water equivalent uh, using a passive gamma ray sensor. And based on this, we um, provide recommendations on the potential to install more of these instruments in similarly remote environments in the future. In the second part of the project, we linked existing snow measurements um, with the new snow water equivalent measurements um, to provide unique, high quality, continuous and near real time snow data set, um, which links soil, permafrost, snow, atmospheric and biological research fields, and which will be essential to develop snow, permafrost and hydrologic models in this data scarce region. Um, the new measurement system was installed in summer 2019 as part of the Bayelva Research Station, um, which comprises metrological and soil measurements about um, three kilometers um, southeast of, or um, sorry, southwest of New Orleans. Um, the new instruments um, provide six hourly measurements of snow water equivalent um, for a surface area of at most 55 square meters and um, hourly snow depth measurements for a surface area of um, maximally 1.3 square meters, depending on the snow depth. Um, these measurements add to the already existing automated um, snow related uh, measurements um, of snow depth, snow temperature, snow dielectric um, constant and snow distribution at the Bayava site. Um, this figure now compares the automated measurements with the manual snow water equivalent and snow depth validation data recorded inside the footprint areas of the automated sensors. Um, it shows the evolution um, of snow water equivalent and snow depth over the 2019 and 2020 snow season at the Bayava site. Um, as you can see, the courses of snow depth and snow water equivalent are very similar. Um, both variables um, increase until reaching a maximum in the middle of April 2020 of about 0.8 meters um, or 225 millimeters respectively. Um, afterwards, the snow water equivalent um, remains almost constant until um, mid-May 2020, while the snow depth begins to slightly decrease. Um, then at the end of uh, May 2020, um, finally, a strong decline in both snow depth and snow water equivalent sets in. And by the beginning of June 2020, um, the area is snow free and both variables return to zero. Um, while in November 2019, um, the individual manual measurements within the footprint area of the snow water equivalent sensor are close together, um, they show quite a large spread. Um, around the curves of automated measurements in spring 2020. And due to this large spatial variation, um, the annual cycle of snow depth and snow water equivalent is not visible from the manual measurements. Um, with only um, one exception, um, all automated snow water equivalent me uh, measurements um, lie within the range of the manual measurements. Um, however, um, the spatial variability of up to 260 millimeters between simultaneous um, manual snow water equivalent measurements at different locations within the footprint area um, exceeds the annual variation of the automatically measured snow water equivalent, um, which is about uh, 225 millimeters. Um, therefore, it is questionable if the spatial resolution of the automated snow water equivalent sensor um, is sufficient to capture the extremely high spatial variability of the um, snow water equivalent um, inside the already relatively small footprint area. Um, and likewise, with a spatial variation of up to 0.81 meters 
um, within the footprint area of the snow water equivalent sensor, um, the spatial variability of the snow depth um, equals its temporal variation over the snow covered period. And therefore, um, the smaller footprint of the snow depth sensor might similarly not be representative of the whole footprint area of the snow water equivalent sensor, um, leading to uncertainties when combining both measurements, um, for example, to calculate the snow density, as I will show you later on. Um, during the three uh, manual measurement sessions, um, the spatial variation of snow depth and snow water equivalent um, increases with their absolute values. Um, however, it has to be taken into account that um, the number of individual manual measurements um, differ significantly between um, these uh, three um, manual measurement campaigns. Yeah, um, further measurements um, performed within the fenced area of the Bayelva climate station um, furthermore helped us um, to uh, verify the observed variations in snow depth and snow water equivalent. Um, for example, um, peaks or um, strong and abrupt in or decreases in snow depth and snow water equivalent, um, which occurred um, at times of high wind speeds, um, indicate a transport of snow by the wind. Um, and the intensity of this wind drift furthermore depended on the temperature and the water content of the snow cover. So dry and um, soft, that means cold snow, uh, snow um, as was present most of the winter, is most prone to wind drift. And the um, fence surrounding the climate station furthermore pr promotes the formation of snow dunes. Um, and also next to verifying um, the onset and the end of the snow covered season, um, as you can see in this figure, um, the surface albedo can indicate periods of um, strong snowfall. Um, for example, um, the high albedo, um, sorry, um, the the high um, albedo of fresh snow um, indicates that um, the increase in snow depth and snow water equivalent at the end of May 2019, um, just before snow melt, um, was related to a snowfall event. Um, and similar to the snow depth, um, the snow density is highly variable over time. And in order to capture its evolution over the course of a winter season, um, regular and thus automated measurements are needed. Um, therefore, we combined the automatically measured snow water equivalent and snow depth estimates to calculate the snow density and compare the resulting time series um, with the manual snow pit measurements. And um, except for the beginning um, of the snow melt uh, season, um, the snow density calculated from the automated observations um, was always within the range of the snow densities derived from the manual measurements. Yeah. And all in all, um, we could conclude that the, the independent uh, manual snow pit measurements um, wind temperature and radiation data um, from the nearby climate station um, verify well the general course and um, strong changes of snow depth and snow water equivalent, um, as well as the onset at the end of the snow covered season, as indicated by the new automated sensors. Um, the new automated measurement system um, therefore reliably captures um, the overall evolution of snow water equivalent. Um, and snow depth over the snow covered season. Um, the, the main difficulty we encountered um, is the high spatial variability of snow water equivalent and snow depth within the footprint areas of the automated sensors um, due to, for example, uneven snow cover um, associated with uneven terrain, um, wind drift or a discontinuous snow cover um, due to, um, for example, patchy snow melt, um, as is shown in this photograph. Um, we therefore expect the automated measurements um, to best represent the snow conditions um, inside their footprint area at sites um, with an even snow cover associated with a flat surface, no larger obstacles and low wind speeds. And among others, um, due to the corona pandemic, we were only able to conduct very few manu manual measurement campaigns last year 
um, but the ongoing automated snow water equivalent measurements um, will allow us for, to further validate the data record in, in the future. Yeah, and with this, I, I would like to thank you for your attention. And um, if you got interested in our project, um, you can refer to a short or a more detailed version of our project report, um, as well as to the corresponding data sets comprising manual and automated snow measurements. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, please feel free to ask questions. Right, well, thanks for the introduction. Um, I would like to introduce the new NightFox campaign to you. And NightFox stands for a new on Turbulence Fiber Optic Experiment. And as you can probably tell, we did not study any wildlife or foxes, but we actually studied atmospheric turbulence. Um, the logo might be a little uh, seducive here. Um, so this was a collaborative effort between the Alfred Wegen Institute, Potsdam, and the Micrometeorology Group at the University of Bayreuth, and this is how you actually pronounce it, but no worries here. And I would like to acknowledge the contribution of all my co-authors that are named here, and also, of course, for SIOS. Uh, thank you very much for funding us. So since uh, we studied atmospheric turbulence, and um, in this talk, I wanted to highlight more the novel technique that we use, the fiber optic distributed temperature sensing. Uh, which is fairly new to the geosciences community, rather than focusing on the nitty-gritty details of atmospheric turbulence. So this is a surely, uh, surely a methodological focus. So <clears throat> the objectives, Night Fox had three objectives. So first of all, we're all aware that the Arctic environment is, is especially heterogeneous, has a lot of interfacial boundaries between the sea ice and the air, the air and the open sea, the open sea and the tundra, and the tundra and the sea ice. So it's all goes in circles here. And we're interested in studying and quantifying the mass and energy exchange. And here, the bigger picture certainly is Arctic amplification. This is kind of the overarching larger goal. Secondly, um, the operational systems located at the New Allison station, at the Avipef station, they show a disagreement. Um, and often, even though they're closely co-located, they show disagreeing temperatures, wind speeds, the wind direction, and so forth. We're trying to understand why this is happening. And third, and last but not least, we wanted to conduct a proof of concept pilot study for using fiber optic sensing in this harsh polar environment. First, to test mechanical brake strength. Does it actually hold up? But secondly, is it feasible? Uh, we didn't we do want any harm to humans, uh, interact with road traffic or to wildlife. So was it basically one of the goals was, can we actually do it in this Arctic environment? Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this, just a quick sketch here. Um, New Alessand, we're at degree, at, located at 79 degrees north, um, the Svalbard Archipelago. And um, this is a zoom in. So New Alessand is at the southern perimeter of the Kongsfjord and is the northernmost inhabited um, research village in the world that is operated year round. So since this is this talk, I would like to keep this methodological focus. I would like to induce the fiber optic distributed temperature sensing technique to you. And obviously we're using fiber optic cables. So um, I think you can see my pointer here. So the inside, the light is actually conducted inside the inner glass core, 50 micrometers, and we're using standard telecommunication fibers um, in general design. And there's some buffering around it to keep the light inside. And then there's some reinforcement of the fiber optic cable, some Kevlar fibers, and there's protective outer jacket out of PVC or out of stainless steel. And um, the entire setup can be as thin as about 0.9 millimeters outer diameter or 1.2 millimeters for aerial deployments. Um, so how does it actually work? So we attach this fiber optic cable to a laser, uh, a DTS laser, and we shoot laser pulses into the fiber optic cable. And as the light travels down the fiber optic cable, the light is backscattered. And we can use, we receive the backscatter, we can use, we can analyze the backscatter and basically determine the temperature of certain sections along the fiber optic cable. The highest resolution units on the market do a resolution of 12 and a half centimeters. Uh, this is sampling resolution and about 25 centimeter physical resolution. And we can go as fast as one second sampling interval. Internally actually samples at 47 kilohertz, but we sample um, at one second minimum. But for a night fox, we actually use nine second sampling just to keep the noise floor down. So let me just, review the technique, how it actually works. So down here, you have a sketch of a spectrum. Um, the blue shifted lights, the high frequencies on the right-hand side and the red shifted frequencies on the left-hand side. And we inject the light here where the arrow is. And as the light is injected into the fiber optic cable, most of the scatter actually goes back. It's elastic scattering. Uh, we're not using this, but we actually, what we do use is the inelastic Raman scattering. 
And here we're having two um, side lobes. First of all, we call the anti-stokes, the blue shifted photons. And we have the red shifted, uh, the low frequency, the called the stokes. And as it just happens to be that the intensity of the blue shifted photons are temperature dependent, while the Stokes intensity is almost temperature independent. So by relating those two to each other, we're getting, actually getting a relative thermometer. Um, this is how fiber optic sensing actually works using the Raman backscatter. But the cool thing is that we cannot only measure temperature with this technique, but we can actually also sense wind with this. And this is what we developed a few years ago. So basically, imagine that you have a fiber optic cable here depicted by this tube. And this tube interacts with this environment through solar transfer, through long wave radiator transfer, so solar short wave transfer, long wave transfer, but also if the fiber is at a different temperature than the surrounding air, there's convective cooling depending on how strong the wind blows. So this is the principle we work off of. So they, essentially it's a long hot, it's a hot wire anemometer. So imagine that you have two electrically, that you have two cables. One is electrically resistively heated and the other one is unheated at air temperature. So as the turbulence with the wind carries, is carried over this cable, it cools down. And the stronger the cooling is, the smaller is going to be the temperature difference between the electrically heated and the unheated. So the temperature difference here, the delta T, is inversely related to the wind speed. And this is exactly the principle that we're using without getting into all the equations. Um, there's a few tweaks here and here, there, but this is essentially how it goes. Okay, um, so what do we actually do? Um, we actually installed um, a fiber optic array. Um, you show it up here in the upper right hand side and thank you very much for actually choosing our slide as the introductory slide for the webinar. It was very cool to see that. Um, upper right one here, and this is as a trapezoidal shape here and the longest length is around 300 meters. Um, there were a few, um, let's say it's challenges, mechanical challenges. We had to cross two roads here and um, as I said, not be intrusive with wildlife, uh, but we all massive those. So we basically strung a fiber optic array horizontally at about one meter above the ground. And uh, we use a total length of about three kilometers of fiber optic cable. And this fiber optic cable was suspended by small towers and three main towers on the corners. And they're all, they're all equipped with eddy covariance flux measurements. And we also ran the cables, not just horizontally, but also vertically up and down. Um, so a total of three kilometers. So even though these cables here appear to be separate, it's one optical path. Everything is sampled at the speed of light, so at once. I would also like to focus your attention here on this column on the left-hand side. It's a high-resolution snow air column, which we'll also some, see some pictures from, or actually some results from. Um, so providing a two and a half millimeter resolution of air temperatures at the snow air interface, which very nicely connects actually with the previous talk. So this is what we did and we were able to sample for 14 days in February, just before the lockdown actually happened. So what I would like to do here is I'd like to show you two uh, nice results that we've, um, that we've collected. And the upper right hand side, you see a little sketch and it highlights the red triangle or the red rectangular, so highlights what is the air that we actually look at right now. Here's a picture of this high resolution column. And we have a two and a half millimeter vertical resolution sampling in the air and about 10 millimeter sampling in the snow. Um, and here are basically two shown, two 12 uh, periods for two different cases. And that very nicely relates to the previous talk for a weak wind situation, one and a half meters per second and strong wind, six meters per second for two 12 hour periods. And just by looking at those, you see that there's very stark differences. Um, just for orientation purposes, X axis is time. The Y axis is about 50 centimeters of this low part of this co column and color coded, you see the air temperature and it's such that the temperature range of which you see the colors exactly the same, even though the absolute temperatures are different for the weak wind and the strong wind case. So weak wind case is much colder down to minus 30, um, but um, it's the same range. So to look at some cool features, I would like to zoom into two three hour sections here, which are shown here um, for these two periods. And I would like to walk you through the cool things. So first of all, within the snow, we see about a gradient of eight Kelvin over the lowest 15 centimeters. This translates about 50 Kelvin per meter. So very strong temperature gradient inside the snow. Um, you see that in the air column, in the air part, you see there's a very fast and fairly homogeneous instantaneous change of air temperature. Um, cold air being displaced by warm air, warmer air being displaced by colder air and so forth. And these stripes are not artifact, but they're real changing atmospheric temperatures. And these changes can be as large as 78 Kelvin. It happens essentially within an instant. You also see that the 
cold footprint signature of these cold, very cold air masses being, being affected passes down into the snow and they penetrate about four centimeters deep, but it takes a couple of minutes to see this in the, in the, um, in the snow profile. Um, and the signature of the air is actually called by what we call sub-mesoscale motions. And I'm gonna go into the entire physics here, but they're essentially motions different than turbulent motions. And this is what basically they penetrate and the air, um, they bring in cold air and warm air, for example, from surrounding glaciers. So in contrast, the strong winds, vanishing temperature gradients, half or one Kelvin per meter, the air is very uniform just because we're having this intense turbulent shear drift mixing, which basically washes out all the differences. Okay, this is the first example. Second example, I would like to show you a section of the horizontal fiber here. Um, and um, this is basically a run in between the Eddy Tower and this first dirt road, and um, also for a weak wind case. And you see now here two panels, upper one is for air temperature, lower for wind speed from these two different techniques. Just for orientation purpose, the y-axis now is the length along the fiber because we're getting spatially continuous observation, which is really cool and unique. And the x-axis is time. And here color-coded upper one is the temperature. And um, there you say basically see the wind speed. So the obvious elephant in the room here is this cold air structure that you see in the middle of the panels with having a very steep and fast changing temperature about five Kelvins with essentially within a few seconds and a flow speed up of about one meter per second as it passes. Um, so that's a very cool feature. Uh, one of the things we're actually after. So um, what you can actually do with fiber optics because it's spatially continuous observations, you can actually put this into a movie. And I tried to do this here and I'll see if you actually see the movie. Can you still see my screen or do you, can you see the movie? So basically this is the section of the fiber optic array that you see. And here is, this is a little movie. Again, temperatures are color coded. You see these bluish colors. This is the cold air moving towards the tower on the left-hand side. And as it arrives there, it washes up the cold air from underneath and lifts it up. Um, let me just replay this here real quick. And basically what you see is that um, the arrow down here points to the wind direction and speed measured by the sonic anemometer. And this is completely unrelated to the direction in which the cold air actually travels. Okay. Um, so that is something that we find very often in these stable bounded airs that the wind speed is completely uncorrelated to the directions at which these cold air structures um, sample. Okay, um, so basically what you see here is a soliton. So a single wave event, which happens actually fairly frequently. So as the single wave soliton moves along, it lifts up the cold air right next to the snow because this is where the cold air is the coldest and lifts it up, moves it through the fiber optic sensor and we can trace it and track it with these fiber optic cables. And as this uplift happens, there's a divergence of so the air basically accelerates on both sides, just like a ball rolling off of a hill and there's a flow speed up. So it's a very cool feature that we actually have um, measured, oh, captured here. So just to summarize, we saw lots of exciting motions and the analysis and analyses continue. Um, one, of the, one of the master students already completed her thesis. The other one still continues, but um, so st stay tuned in. So it seems like that the sub scale motions, the solitons, they have preferential paths and they're guided by local topography, which actually explains the disagreement between these closely, this fiber optic technique is uh, basically is now as reindeer and Arctic approved, really one. So I think we're really happy about this outcome. And if you're opening on the slides, if you're interested and you can basically get the fiber optics, the SOX team would like to thank you for your attention. And thanks again, Silas, for funding us papers out there. Feel free to browse those. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I'm Luke Cockton. I'm a PhD student working under the supervision of Professor David Pierce. So our project is called Arctic BioAir. So firstly, this slide is just to run through a project summary. So our project is focused on analyzing the role of primary biological aerosol particles. So this is bacteria, and we're looking at the uh, role of these bacteria in atmospheric processes such as cloud formation. So it's known that bacteria can cause cloud formation firstly by acting as cloud condensation nuclei, where they act as a particle to allow water vapor to condense. And secondly, some bacteria have actually been shown to express a cell membrane protein, this is known as an ice nucleation protein. So this INP can cause the nucleation of ice on its surface and contribute to the formation of ice and mixed phase clouds. So the aim of this project is to investigate the distribution and source of biogenic INP in the Arctic. So a little bit of background on aerosols in the Arctic. So it's known that temperatures in the Arctic have increased by approximately one and a half degrees over the past 30 years. And approximately one degrees of this warming is actually the result of aerosols both directly and indirectly which highlights the significance and importance of aerosols. 
So aerosol characteristics in the summer months in the Arctic appear to be largely uh, contributed to local marine biogenic sources. And actually recently, several nucleation events in the Arctic field studies have actually been shown to be correlated with uh, air mass flow over melting sea ice regions. So this prior research kind of provides a potential link between increased biological activity associated with sea ice melt in the summertime and uh, new aerosol formation. So this sort of sets the stage for our microbiological investigations to close this link. So a little bit of background on uh, microbial ecology in Svalbard, which a previous PhD student in our group, uh, Lewis Cuthbertson, actually looked at. So they utilize both culture dependent and independent techniques to analyze bacterial community structure and abundance in the air above Svalbard. Uh, so airborne bacterial assemblages in both terrestrial and marine environments contain more than 150 genera of bacteria, which is actually quite a high level of diversity comparable to other nutrient poor environments, such as Antarctic snow. And the aerial bacterial diversity was actually similar to other area biological studies from both polar and non-polar environments. So just a little bit of some key phyla detected were actinobacteria, bacterioides, firmicutes, and proteobacteria. This is actually in correlation to a previous study uh, by Harding et al. in 2011. There's not actually many studies looking at this, so it's quite interesting that they did actually correlate. And importantly, viable bacteria are actually present in all samples. Thus, bacteria are ubiquitous in the air of Svalbard. So bacteria's primary biological aerosol particles then. So the first bacteria shown to initiate ice formation was in the 1970s, and this was Pseudomonas syringae. So this is actually important because it causes ice formation associated with plants. Since then, other members of this gamma proteobacteria group, such as P. fluorescence and E. herbicola, have also shown such activity. And more recently, there's actually been quite a lot of molecular studies to analyze this mechanism of action, which has been shown to involve a single ice nucleation protein. Uh, this can form aggregates, but this protein is bound to the cell surface and possesses, possesses both hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions, which promote the binding of water molecules. And this has been found in around 10 bacterial species, which are all gram negative. So the INP protein is actually between 1,200 and 1,500 amino acids in length, and it contains three domains. I'll just talk about two here. So the, the diagram at the bottom is just sort of a simplistic view to analyze this. So the N-terminal domain, which actually binds to the membrane, is important because it can also have the addition of a PI group bound to the sugar manan, which is important because if, if that's present, it can actually cause further aggregation of these proteins. Uh, so this can cause the formation of a class A site, which is just describing the most active site. And this can cause ice nucleation at temperatures of up to minus five degrees, which is actually really high compared to other inorganic uh, aerosol particles. And then there's also the central repeating domain of this protein, which is the, the repeating domain, which contains 16 residue repeats, which actually can form the template for ice formation. So our specific project aims then, so we want to first of all complete the understanding of bacterial distribution and abundance in the atmosphere above Svalbard. This is sort of building on the work from 2017 studies in our group to determine the ice nucleation gene diversity and distribution within these bacteria and to investigate the microbial influence on ice nucleation in the Arctic. So this is important to determine the proportion of ice nucleation activity attributable to biogenic sources. And the aim of all this is to aid modeling and climate models to predict the likely impact of this activity. So we've kind of devised our project into three phases. So the first phase is the initial field work. Uh, so, so just a brief, a uh, highlight of some sampling locations which we want to target. So there's Nilesund, which we also want to do the Zeppelin station, Peridian, Longyearbyen, Barentsburg, Spear, Kapline, and Hornsund. And at um, Longyearbyen and Nilesund, we want to take three altitudinal transects. And then this information is here is just to sort of highlight that if we took 386 samples, this would be the equivalent of over 3 million liters of air. And we know from a previous work that uh, at a density of 100,000 cells per liter, this would contain the equivalent of three times 10 to the 11 cells. So we're getting quite a lot of data here. So to do this, we're going to be using portable sampling techniques. So an example is just shown on the right, which is involved in active filtration, where we use a pump to get a specific air flow rate. So you know that you can do 50 liters per minute. So you know how much air you've actually sampled through. This will then be linked to a collect collection device, which contains a membrane of 0.2 micrometers pores. And then this membrane is what we'll actually analyze down layer in the lab. And then just to highlight another approach, we can also collect into a liquid, which is known as impingement. Uh, this can just be sterile water 
or we can also use an RNA solution, which actually degrades other cellular material to preserve the RNA if we want to look at metabolic activity at the time of sampling. So phase two, this is um, a temporal anal analysis, which will involve the Zeppelin station and collaboration with Radovan Krecki. So the reason why I want to use the Zeppelin is because it's got um, existing infrastructure such as air, uh, air inlets and the GCVI, which is a ground-based counterflow virtual impactor. Uh, so this will allow the an analysis of cloud droplets and ice crystals from uh, non-activated aerosols. So this actually allows us to study the presence or absence of biogenic ice nucleation actually in cloud residuals. So phase three, I'm just highlighting some of the laboratory work. So we can do total cell counts from these membrane filters using techniques such as DAPI and CTC. We can also do FISH. Um, we can also do biochemical investigations. So to actually analyze the IN gene expression, you would do reverse transcriptase qPCR, where we actually convert the RNA, which is suggesting the gene's been expressed to DNA, and then use that as a template for our amplification, which is the polymerase chain reaction. And then the presence or absence of IN genes can actually be determined by using uh, a primer pair, which is highlighted here, which have been shown in a previous paper to analyze all the different variants of the um, IN gene. So I mentioned there was 10 previously. And then you can quantify specific uh, variants using qPCR. So a little bit of background. This is where you essentially are amplifying your DNA using um, specific primers, which are going to bind to a specific region of the DNA. And then as the polymerase chain reaction goes through, you're amplifying this target sequence. Uh, and then you, you, it's involving fluorescence, so it's real time. So you're going to you use a dye which binds to this DNA. And then the CT value is the number of cycles to actually go above fluorescence. So via this technique, you can first of all detect, is the ice nucleation gene present? And then in what abundance? So how does this contribute to the CLS observing system? So this is to develop existing work on the physical, physical aspects of aerosols and cloud formation uh, that's already been carried out the Zeppelin. Uh, specifically, we attempt to address the interactions between the biological, or bacterial, and INP, chemical and physical factors in cloud formation dynamics. So this project will ultimately help to define new interactions between the biosphere, geosphere, and atmosphere. Thanks for listening, and I'd like to thank CLS for funding the project. And if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch. I've just got my email linked there as well. Good. Then I'm going to present you my access proposal. And it's uh, quite important to mention that I'm giving the presentation, but there's actually a lot of people involved in this. So it's that you read only my name here doesn't mean that it's only me doing this project. Okay. I just start with a. Uh, Let's see if I can, yeah, here we go. Start with a little Svalbard inhabitant. Uh, I think quite a few of you are familiar with this or these guys. I would call them lonely fighters. You quite often encounter them alone. And uh, I would rather compare our situation as scientists uh, with these guys, especially these days in Corona. And uh, yeah, it's quite often that you're out in the field and you get amazing data and then you realize, hmm, I could do even more if I had more data and would know what's going on about some other stuff. So I'm kind of missing information. But it's the same with um, these little guys. As soon as you get more, and they tend to be more, you get proper science. So as soon as you get international and collaborative and interdisciplinary, you can actually get way more insights into your data. And you can potentially get some innovative stuff done. And with that, that's already pretty much the goal of this project or the main goal is to really try to get a bit of collaboration going and uh, share data between different projects to actually coach, yeah, join a bigger, larger data set that can help one to make each other's uh, data in total more valuable. And for that, uh, it's a bit of a question, where can you find a good objective that you can actually combine different disciplines and different nations doing stuff to get some nice things done. And it turns out there is a very nice case of a glacier lake outburst flood up in Setevatnet, which is just outside New Orleans. And if I zoom in a little bit, we have uh, at the end of the fjord, we have corner vein. That's when you look out on, uh, towards the east in New Orleans. And, and then on the right side, on the, on the southern side of corner vein, we have Kongsvegen. And here we have the little lake, Setevatnet. And here's a time-lapse camera video from Chakola from the Norwegian Polar Institute, who has this camera up there since 2018. And just to specify that the camera is standing here 
and it's looking down the lake in this direction. So you see the glacier on the left, and you see Setevatne pretty much in the center of the picture. And uh, the video starts in April, and I just zoom in a lot, scroll a bit forward, so you see basically at the start, you just see nothing. It's just the sediments and the glacier here on the left, and the fjord would also be on the left side. And then, uh, yeah, pretty much end May, early, no, so it's scrolling, here we go. And May, early July, early, early June, the lake starts forming by meltwater. Let's just zoom a little bit forward. So you see the lake is forming as we have more and more melt and the snow is disappearing. And now just start watching uh, the glacier here. So the glacier actually starts lifting up because of the water and part of the water starts draining under the glacier and forms a lake under the ice or a subglacial lake. And then the thing just starts or well, keeps filling up. Again, here we go. And again, just uh, keep an eye on the left part of the picture about the glacier, how it keep going, keeps going up. <coughs> so now the image is also finally clear. And now the action pretty much starts in a few seconds. Here we go. So at some point in the melt season, the whole thing just rapidly drains within one to three days a bit of defending. And uh, this thing is happening every year, every year with the snow melt. Sometimes we do have uh, a second or a third event later on when you have, when you have heavy rainstorms, but the big flood event is really up in the Spring snow melts, or sometimes June, July. Each year, it's a bit of varying three, four weeks back and forth. And uh, so, we thought about how can we measure this thing? Because one thing it's affecting the glacier, it's obviously called the speeding up the glacier, but it's also going out in the fjord and potentially putting in a lot of nutrients into the fjord and affecting what is going on in there. And we also have a topic that it might be an ecosystem, or it is an ecosystem under the glacier, so that might be also affected. And in total, we have a lot of different groups working out there, trying to do stuff. And if you all join up, you could actually create a very nice uh, collaborative data set and figure out what is actually happening during this flood event and how does it affect different components. And that's uh, pretty much what we came up with, looking at different groups and uh, different data platforms that are available. And that is a lot. And I'll quickly run you through some of the plans that uh, we are planning to do. And I can only tell you, it's a lot of different institutes that are either directly involved or trying to work out in the glacier or the adjacent fjord area. And there's a, quite a bit of funding involved by now. So up at the lake, we are hoping to first of all figure out uh, what is the actual drainage volume, what is the conditions during drainage, like for example, what's the lake pressure, what, when the lake starts draining. For, the, for that, we hope to do some uh, yeah, 3D DMs if we have actually water under the ice. And then what we're also going to do, we run water quality analysis and turn that down with the fjord to figure out how many nutrients go down in the fjord, putting automatic weather stations on uh, Kongsvig to really have an idea of what is going on at this specific area. You're also already out there, so we get a, get an idea about what's going on in three dimensions that, and uh, area changes. Then uh, if you move over to the glacier, like the glacier is going to I do a search anytime soon, and that might mean that we actually get to an unstable point. Like investigating the search at the moment, which is a bit uh, hidden boreholes in the glacier that didn't happen because of Corona. The post made one to two boreholes into the glacier to investigate the uh, temperature, but it already is clear that there will be complications likely not get into the country. But in addition, uh, there's already an ongoing weather station network up there. We have the GPS up there. The glacier is already additional seismic area up there. And now in the coming, so put up more seismometers, both at the glacier front and also high up and probably also close to the lake. And what we're going to test is to put up a low cost DGPS network, which is uh, yeah, around 5,000 kroners a piece instead of 100,000 kroners for a commercial device and should still give us about one centimeter resolution with a much higher battery life. So we're going to test that for about two months out there. Then uh, that's something I'm personally working on this a lot over the past couple of years. That's drifters, so that's small electronic devices. Hmm. My computer is a bit slow, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here we go, that's small electronic devices, small capsules that are built to go with the water and you can throw them in a glacier. And uh, the idea is that we actually have from our models that we have a good estimation about where the main drainage of 
the glacier in general happens and also where the water is supposed to drain through that from the lake when it happens, I estimate to be about eight hours transit time from satellite remote sensing. And uh, we kind of would like to first figure out where exactly is the water going and on what pressure does it have. And for that, we hope to send down these drifters. So, yeah, my computer is really slow here. You see it going down at Big Moulin and Kongsvegen last summer. And uh, if successful and if we find those devices again, they would give us a flow pass, just like here. That's also from a flow path of a glacier under the surface. We can reconstruct the whole path this thing takes and the whole pressure at every location, and you can get some additional data as well. Then at the fjord, there's a lot of activity planned out there as well. There's a project looking at the wave carving interactions, so putting up seismometers and pressure sensors and uh, look how the wave action influences the carving on the glacier. Then we plan to put out a temporal mooring right where the water comes out pretty much as far as we can get with Tyson to take out the mooring. And uh, that mooring will have a couple of instruments to look at the water currents. And then we also see if we, for example, can see uh, uh, currents that are influenced by the carving at the ocean fjord. The Italian Polar Institute is planning to send a, an AUV out there and do some trials. So and uh, probably get a couple of investigations of DTD profiles out in the plume. And we're going to use that as well to potentially try to recover our drifted devices via AOV. So we are working on looking to getting a couple of prototypes out that could communicate with each other. The Norwegian Polar Institute has their pelagic monitoring going on. So we will link this up with them to also look at, again, water and nutrients going into the fjord from that drainage and see if they had any influence. And then we are planning to send the Czech Polar research vessel up there to do a multiple beam bathymetry survey and actually see if we can find an imprint of this flood on the marine geological record. Then there's obviously also a lot of remote sensing that is already by default available, like the ESA satellites or the NASA satellites or the planet constellation. We also have radar satellite. And uh, as it's rather, there is the Cyrus aircraft, which is really nice, as we know that there are have already been flight lines. So there's a good chance to get a very good default DEM from last autumn. But in addition, what is quite interesting, since uh, one and a half years or so, we have ISAT 2, which is a laser satellite in from NASA. And it turns out that this laser satellite has three flight paths that are crossing right on top of the lake. So that actually gives us a very good uh, opportunity to check when we do our laser scans on the ground and our time-lapse camera stuff to actually check how good this uh, product is that we get from the elevation data from that laser. And uh, yeah, from our plans, we plan to be there from yeah, probably end May, early June to mid-July with a core team of three persons to maintain and get out the basic installations. And theoretically, that's uh, say theoretically it gets quite busy in uh, early July with up to 17 people trying to work out there and a lot more people being involved behind the scenes that are not out in the field. And we hope to get the Czech polar vessel out uh, in end July for four or five days to do the vicinity survey at the glacier front. And uh, we hope to get them going out there for June, July for yeah, one to two months, depending on when the lake is draining and depending how conditions are. But as everything is this year and uh, last year, there's always an iceberg ahead. The first thing is, uh, we don't really know how the search will develop, so it might not be possible by summer to get safely to the lake. At the moment, it should still be doable, but if the search suddenly develops quite fast, it might not be doable, we don't know. Um, there is a bit of a boat issue in New Orleans in these days that it's not clear if you can actually use those small polar circles or not, which would obviously make things uh, way more complicated. And of course, we still have Corona, and as it looks like all our international collaborators might not be able to get to New Orleans in summer. So there's a quite big uncertainty around that and planning is a bit special these days. And of course, uh, we never know. There's for sure gonna be more stuff that shows up. But that's uh, pretty much just some yeah, preliminary plans and uh, we have changing plans all the time and try to make like a basic plan as soon as we as good as we can get it at the moment. But if you are working in the area back to the, the end of the fjord or towards the glacier and uh, are interested in sharing logistics or 
sharing data, get in touch, because it might be quite interesting. And that's it. Thanks uh, for your attention. In today's talk, I tried to uh, bring in to a broader topic, which is uh, the overarching question to my CIOS Access Call funded project. So it's like new particle formation in Arctic. What are the knowns and the unknowns? And what question uh, our project tries to answer? And uh, the, the specific project funded through CIOS is the molecular steps of new particle formation in the Arctic atmosphere. And this is kind of long-term measurements, which has been ongoing since 2017. And uh, it's uh, headed by Mick Kosipela, our project head, but a, a component or the part of project uh, in carried out in the year 2021 is uh, led by me as the project principal investigator. But there are like a lot of people involved who would be taking part in the campaign. And our group is the Polar Arctic Atmospheric Research Group. And the details can be found in this uh, uh, web link here for all the people involved in this research. And now I can go to a brief, very brief in introduction for people who are not from the atmospheric background. Um, aerosols are small particles which are suspended in the air and they can act as cloud condensation nuclei. That's the, the cloud condensation nuclei is the main catching term for our project actually because that's how the climate gets affected. And they play a very important role in the development and formation of clouds affecting their albedo, the frequency and lifetime of clouds. And these aerosol particles are emitted in a variety of ways. They can be either emitted directly into the atmosphere, then they are called the primary particles, or if they are produced in the atmosphere through a process called gas to particle conversion, uh, uh, they are secondary aerosols. And actually our project or our, our, our overall science here in the new particle formation is basically focused on this secondary aerosol particles. And here in the side, if you see the small schematics, um, which shows these, these uh, small uh, vapors which are emitted uh, as precursor vapors to these particles. These are the vapors which are the primary, you can say the feed particles or the feed vapors which initiate the new particle formation processes in any atmosphere around the globe. They form a small cluster and these clusters coagulate and nucleate to form a bigger uh, particle. And that's how we determine how fast they are growing and if at all the particular particle can be grown to a size which is relevant for the cloud condensation nuclei, particularly the size is at 50 nanometers, but we, we measured it from very small sizes like one to three nanometers. So basically when we say this process of new particle formation, this involves the formation of very high concentration of sub nanometer sized particles, that is one to three nanometers and followed by the growth. We also monitor the growth and the entire mechanism is actually uh, published in many papers, starting from our group uh, head, that Kumala et al, 2014. And we also see that around the globe, uh, I mean, globally, the atmospheric observations show that 10% to 60% of these new particle formation events lead to CCN formation. So they can be very important processes to monitor the overall climate effect in Arctic. Okay, and on the, the slide is just not going ahead. I can maybe try. Yes. Yes. So what we know of this process is an Arctic till date. Um, a number of studies, both at Rubad and Zeppelin Station, have um, tried to figure out the different emissions, like the methyl sulfide emissions, organic compounds, specifically over both the, this organic compounds have actually not been measured in actually New Orleans, but Canadian Arctic, then biogenic organic compounds in, measured in Western Greenlands and some iodine species. These uh, particular uh, precursor vapors uh, are the feed partic feed, feeding particles for the growth of uh, bigger particles which form clouds condensation nuclei. So apparently it's very important to know what are the sources of these vapors. But till date, these are just quantified as uh, in aerosol particles, but the entire mechanism of new particle formation, how the molecular clusters coagulate, nucleate, and then grow into CCN has not been um, checked till date in Svalbard. But 
I quote some of the studies which have touched the topic of new particle formation from the point of particle size distribution, but not from the chemistry point of view. That's from a study in, uh, by Dal Oth et al. in 2017, and he precisely points out that the frequency in the Arctic atmospheres of these new particle formation is found to be correlated with the diminishing sea ice extent. That means it, the, the sea ice um, melting was causing some emissions of precursor vapors initiating new particle formations. Then the other study um, uh, in the high Arctic is that the, um, a large particle uh, uh, concentration can contribute to the CCN number concentration, but still there is no um, data available what is the chemistry of these particles. And then a very, very recent and important study over the Central Arctic Ocean touches on the iodine chemistry. And it states that iodine was the driving factor of NPF over the Arctic Ocean. But since uh, Arctic Ocean is quite a pristine location and it's marine, unlike the New Orleans coastal environment. So uh, still I can say that the chemistry might be quite different from the Arctic Ocean chemistry and New Orleans or Svalbard coastal area. The last study uh, is from our group. Uh, this is the NPF processes. We have tried to check what are the processes over two Arctic sites. One is Greenland and one is New Orleans. And this uh, was published in GRL this December, very recent. And I will present the findings of this paper and a group, uh, how uh, this chemistry of gases affect new particle formation, particularly in New Orleans. So this is a stemmed out publication from the project which I'm presenting. So uh, the no unknowns which I, I was talking about has been pinpointed in various uh, studies, uh, which actually state, I have quoted the sentences from actually the papers on, on which our project is based, that we fulfill the gaps pointed out by the previous studies, that the detailed chemical and understanding uh, down to the molecular scale level is actually missing in Arctic. And then the contribution of gases precursors to Arctic marine secondary organic aerosols remains pure, poor, poorly defined. And further, the details of chemical driven mechanisms of new particle formation and how they form the cloud condensation nuclear production over ice covered and open Arctic waters have been largely unknown. And this, the last part uh, we are trying to answer in the paper by Beck et al. 2020 and Bakarani et al. 2020 has answered the above two unknowns over the Arctic Ocean at least. So here uh, I start with the Arctic Ocean study which is very very much um, overlapping with a part of a study in New Orleans and here maybe I can uh, pointer yes here as you see the purple line is the iodic acid concentration and the red line is the sulfuric acid concentration. And this is measured right uh, uh, over the Arctic Ocean when the sea ice was started to freeze. And they see around uh, a concentration of iodic acid uh, um, with the concentration of eight into 10 to the power six molecules per cubic centimeter. And this is actually six to 10 times higher than sulfuric acid, which is quite unusual because uh, this new particle formation, when we check in the cities, urban cities, boreal forests, generally we see this concentration of sulfuric acid quite high, which initiates the new particle formation. But apparently the, the mechanism is quite reverse when we come to the Arctic region. And they also try to uh, know through chemical mass spectrometers that how many molecules were involved in this new particle formation. And this band of uh, uh, the yellow band is actually the particle size distribution. And it can be seen from the diameter on the left-hand axis. And it clearly shows that when the particle, the concentration of iodine starts to rise, particles starts to form. And they link, uh, the paper links that increase of iodic acid um, and the formation of these particles to sea ice freezing. But still the mechanism, like when the sea ice freeze, is there some disturbance in the, 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 the temperature of the water or the microbiological bio, diversity in that which releases this iodic acid in the atmosphere, which, which initiates a new particle formation. But we still don't know. And here again, uh, when I was saying that the marine Arctic environment could be very different from the Arctic terrestrial environment was pinpointed in a very recent study 
by Park et al. And he clearly states that the terrestrial ecosystems in the coastal area, which has tundra, strongly affects aerosol emissions, possibly more than the anthropogenic Arctic emission. And uh, if we see here in the Arctic terrestrial here, the part, the, they are, there are very strong events. The red portion are the, actually the particle size distributions, which show that it is much more stronger than the Arctic marine or even the Pacific side, uh, the marine Pacific ocean. And they say in the paper, they conclude that the increased tundra emissions and melting sea ice should be considered in the future Arctic atmospheric composition and climate simulations. So now I come to our group's work that what we tried to fulfill the gaps here. Um, we carried out the same study uh, with chemical ionization mass spectrometers over Greenland and in New Orleans and situated at Grover Badit since the study was ongoing from 2017. And finally, some results are out. And uh, we have some surprising results from New Orleans, but I'll get back to that. Here is that at Willem, uh, in Greenland station, we report a very low concentration of sulfuric acid and methane sulfonic acid. These are the compounds which are emitted from the DMS, the phytoplankton community. And uh, we see that uh, iodic acid in, term, in this case of Greenland, of course it's present, but it seems to be insufficient to grow into particles which can act as cloud condensation nuclei. This was quite contradictory to the results published over the Arctic Ocean. And we see this was because um, the iodic acid had a very strong signal over the ocean areas rather than a sea locked region of Greenland. Uh, like our, our concentration at Willem was, uh, I think, one to two orders lower than that detected in the Arctic Ocean. So this could be probably one case that here iodic acid cannot nucleate. I mean, it, it is nucleating, but it's not growing, helping the particles grow to cloud condensation nuclei. Then we come to New Orleans and data, which is again quite opposite to Greenland since it has many other, like the open sea ice conditions and uh, the sea ice conditions actually affect what is being emitted in the atmosphere. So we try to correlate the chlorophyll A concentration in the Kongsfjord and saw what we see in the mass spectrometer during the May season. And we see this blue line is the methane sulfonic acid quite rising only during this time when there is phytoplankton blooms in Kongsfjord. And then when we come from June to July, another surprising thing is that we have never noticed and actually not reported anywhere else also that this organic part, the green part, starts to rise very drastically. And we have quite a high concentration, which is generally expected in a boreal forest. Uh, the homes, uh, the highly oxygenated molecules, so-called the organic compounds, uh, till date from our group and other studies around the globe have detected such high concentrations only in the boreal forest or at some urban cities. But having this highly oxygenated molecules in Arctic calls for another uh, campaign and more detailed analysis about these organic compounds. And these organic compounds are important because once we have some nucleated particles present in the atmosphere, they are capable to condense over these particles and cause their growth. So the more these organic molecules are present, the more, uh, the faster the growth of particles could be, and maybe it affects the budget of the cloud condensation nuclei. So. Click right, right mouse. Um, uh, this is, <laughs> maybe the animations are a problem maybe. But if you click next, yes, I was trying to do that. Okay. Yes, next is working. Thanks. Um, here, um, I've tried to show you some results, which is looks the slide looks quite complicated, but I can explain here that the at our Greenland station we saw a weaker particle growth. And when we compared spring and summer season, we saw that during the springtime, pure iodic acid nucleation dominated, which is this um, yellow uh, uh, line, it's iodic acid. And when we come to the same point in summer, the, the iodic acid decreases and we have this red 
or, um, bar going up, which is sulfuric acid. And so now when we compare new olesins during spring and summer, uh, it's a total different chemistry. Uh, here we see that new olesin, we have ion induced. Ion induced means charged particles, um, which are mostly composed of sulfuric acid and ammonia. This pathway of sulfuric acid and ammonia coagulating or condensing together forms a very important pathway of secondary aerosol formation over Arctic during the springtime. But this mechanism is not necessarily the same during neolescent, in neolescent during the summertime. Uh, during the summertime, what's happening is this the, the green bars down below is the homes. Homes is the highly oxygenated molecules, the organic compounds I was talking about. They take over everything and they contribute largely to the growth of these particles. And as you, as you can see here in the summertime, we have quite intense particle formation and including their growth. So what we do not know. So this part of the study is already published regarding iodic acid, sulfuric acid, and ammonia in neolysin, and also compared to Greenland. But what we don't know is the, this, the organic molecules called HOMS. We just saw them and we report them that they are present, but this was beyond the scope of uh, the, the long-term monitoring we had carried out till date in Neolison that what are the sources of these, because we generally did not expect them to be seen on, in our mass spectrometer spectra. So uh, my project here from 2021 actually is to know the sources of homes in Neolison. Um, we speculate or hypothesize based on the studies I discussed uh, in the previous slides, the, the volatile organic compounds emitted from the Arctic tundra. This is including the vegetation. It could be the bare soil. It could be the covering, the moss cover over the permafrost soil in Neolison. And even uh, the plankton or the sea surface is capable of emitting some volatile organic compounds. Literature has already documented that these uh, volatile organic compounds in any terrestrial regions are a very strong source of these organic compounds called homes. And it's a huge and complex process of auto-oxidation. I won't discuss it here. And it's been well published from um, another group at our, at our institute. If anybody is interested how these organic compounds are actually formed, they can have a look at this Bianchi et al. 2019. Uh, but that is that uh, uh, we need to quantify first these VOCs, if at all they are emitted from the vegetation, bare soil, and other ecosystems in Arctic, and how much they are uh, impacting or emitted. This data needs to be correlated with the data of organic molecules, which we detect from our chemical ionization mass spectrometers. And we need some back calculations or calculation of yields to connect both of these data together to actually come to a conclusion whether the local sources in Arctic are actually forming the, the organic compounds capable of disturbing the CCM concentration or actually contributing to the cloud formation. So the aims of the project, uh, present project, which is going to be carried out in this year, is to understand the role of biogenic volatile organic compounds and their oxidation products, which are homes. And of course, since it's a long-term project, we also monitor the DMS oxidation products, iodine compounds, how they contribute in aerosol formation and growth processes. Tracing the sources of these organic compounds and also understanding the effect of changes in temperature snow cover and vegetation on the emissions of these biogenic volatile organic compounds. So the first point um, involves a lot, means uh, we have in-house instruments already in Grover Badet and it's a long-term research program. And the uh, objective two and three would be just campaign based because we just want to know the sources of homes. Um, uh, so probably this would be only for this year, 2021, it's a seasonal campaign. So. I would give the details how and when it will be carried out. And uh, the area of study is New Orleans. The long-term instruments are housed at the Group of Research Laboratory and our other experiments, the flux experiments would be carried out at different surfaces in and around the Group of area and also Bahavia site. And um, we have a collaboration with the Institute of Geoscience and Earth Resources um, Italy to collect some soil core samples for us and um, I would be uh, assisting them but we'll share the sam samples 
And uh, we plan to bring that, uh, those samples from the active level of permafrost to our laboratory. And we have a setup here in, in our, um, like a chamber setup where we subject the different soils or and the active layer of the permafrost to different temperatures, thaw them and see what is being released, like what kind of VOC is being released, because this is not possible to monitor on site. This is the only work, uh, laboratory work involved in this project, rest everything is on site. Um, here, uh, methodology and instrumentation. And uh, first I should be uh, clear, the box, the green box is uh, only the campaign based instrumentations involved for 2021. But uh, the other two instruments, the chemical ionization mass spectrometer, the image which you see on the extreme down left hand side is already Itgrovabadit. And uh, we also have a particle size distribution measurement instrument already in Itgrovabadit online and running. Although now we have some maintenance going on for the CI Apitov and I would be taking it back in April along when I start my field campaign and set it up again running. But here, this is a, a very small setup, uh, which I would be operating from uh, for various seasons and on different surfaces to measure the BWAP fluxes. And these are actually the manual steady state flow through chambers attached to some tubes. These are 10x tubes. They have some adsorbent filled. I try to push in some clean air uh, from the chamber to these 10x tubes. If the chamber is placed, for example, over a tundra or region like a vegetation, having some flowers or um, leaves or a moss bed, then uh, there are different 10x tubes uh, sampled for 120 minutes at one particular spot, uh, which traps all the VOCs from that particular um, uh, ecosystem. And uh, uh, Sorry, Rosalind, could you try to wrap up? Um, uh, like, Sorry, yes. uh, could you try to wrap up um, in a minute? And we or have some laboratory. <laughs> okay, so these are the, some preliminary results from those 10 X tubes, which we did in 2019. Uh, and we saw some really good fluxes here. And this is the connection with our chemical ionization mass spectrometers, the organic compounds we saw at the same time when we saw the fluxes. And the campaign planned is from April 2021, June 2021, and uh, July and September. Um, then, uh, implications of the study, of course, this is a baseline data and it will help us tracing the source of these organic compounds. And most importantly, we don't have much data on such chemistry. So uh, if this data is generated, there will be less uncertainty in the models. And of course, the climatic impact of um, on Arctic with respect to Arctic aerosols and cloud condensation, nuclei would be assessed. And this project is supported by a lot of fundings and also from the Italian station, which is our research facility where we go and, uh, and they host us. So I thank all of them for supporting this project. Thank you.